no secret that this is probably my favorite topic in the course. So, um, and there's so much to talk about. There's like, we can talk for, about this for days on end, but it's just one lecture, so bear with us. But, all right. So, uh, so you can start. Uh, uh, make sure you fill out the attendance form. The the uh, key today is is now. Um, so yellkey.com slash now. Um, and read the quote while you're at it. So, summary is space is big. Um, so I'm going to start by giving you an overview of how big space is and, and where everything is situated. So some, some of you might have seen the, um, the models of the solar system where you have like, like you have the sun and, uh, and then like Mercury and then Venus and then Earth and then Mars and then Jupiter and Saturn and then Uranus and Neptune and we don't have about Pluto. Um, so these are way, way off. Like it's, um, it's, it's, it's even an understatement to say that they're way off. They don't represent the distances between objects and, and the size difference between like the sun and the uh, and like the Earth. So I want to start by giving you a sense of scale of the universe. So I'm going to do that by, so the Earth is like uh, 13,000 kilometers in diameter, right? So let's, let's take the Earth and scale it down to the size of a soccer ball, all right? So if the Earth were the size of a soccer ball, how large would the moon be compared to this? Um, the moon is around a third of the size of a soccer ball, so it would be like, this, um, and it would be um, in, in like this distance scale, the moon would be about as distant as that wall. It's like 24 meters, and I'm not sure how far away that wall is, but I think it's vaguely accurate. Um, so the moon is, is pretty far away compared to the Earth, right? You can already see that. Um, now let's take the sun. How far away is the sun? The sun, if, if this is the size of the Earth, the sun would be somewhere near the Bay Bridge. Um, so, like, if you don't know where the Bay Bridge is, you go out and uh, and uh, try to spot it after this. So, the sun is extremely far away. And more importantly, how large would the sun be? This 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 picture doesn't give you a sense of the scale of size between the Earth and the sun. So, if, if the Earth were around this size, the sun would be um, approximately the size of the Campanile Tower. So, if you put this next to the Campanile Tower, you can see how much larger the sun is than the Earth. So. Suffice it to say, stars are huge, and the sun is just a middling average star. It's, it isn't um, particularly exceptional in size or anything. Um, there are other stars that are even larger. And so, um, even in this model, if, if the sun is somewhere near the Bay Bridge, you can see how the measurement of like kilometers will quickly start to break down. You'll start talking about um, um, measurements in kilometers that are just so far away that they don't make sense anymore. Remember, there are 13,000 kilometers in this thing. Yeah. So imagine how many kilometers there are between here and the sun, and that's only the start. That's only the beginning. So I'm not even going to bother um, telling you how many kilometers away the sun is. I don't think it's relevant. Um, instead, we're going to abandon the units of kilometers for pretty much the duration of, of this and the, and the next lecture. And we're going to introduce some other units instead. So the, the unit of choice will be um, light time. So let's start by, by light minutes, right? So a light minute is the amount of time it takes for light to travel in one minute. Light is extremely, extremely fast. So a light minute is still a, a mind-bogglingly like, large distance measurement. Um, and so on this scale, the sun is around eight light minutes away. Another way to think about this is we, we're always looking at the sun as it was eight minutes in the past, right? Um, so um, now, what's the size of our whole solar system from like one side of the orbit of Neptune to the other side of the, the orbit of Neptune? What's the size of our whole solar system? Um, it would take light about 18, 11 hours to cross from one side of the solar system to the other side of the solar system. So um, the solar system itself is, is, is pretty huge in itself. 
Um, now, to the nearest star, it's a full four light years away. It would take light four years. So even the closest star to the sun um, is, is a whole four light years away. This is like um, a massive, massive distance. Most of the space between our solar system and this star is just empty, right? Um, and, and vaguely, the other stars in our galaxy are situated, are spaced about, like, significantly apart from each other. There is very little of a chance that they, they, they'll ever actually interact physically with each other um, because they're like four light years away. It's a huge distance, right? So um, zooming out further, the Milky Way galaxy itself has a diameter of around 100,000 light years. So it would take light just to travel from one end of the Milky Way to the other end of the Milky Way. It takes 100,000 years. Now, um, zoom out further still, and you get to the nearest galaxy to the Milky Way, the Andromeda Galaxy. The Andromeda Galaxy is a full two and a half million light years away. And just a quick interjection, I, we're working on trying to get the telescopes up at the top of Campbell open so that you guys can, can have a look at the night sky some, sometime, and hopefully you'll be able to see the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, it won't look very impressive, but keep in mind that uh, what you might see is something that's been traveling, like light that's been traveling for two million years before we change our yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So here's a question that I'm gonna ask. Um, so I will tell you that um, it is known, so astronomers know at this point, that in around five billion years, the Andromeda galax galaxy will collide with the Milky Way. We're on, we're on a collision course already. So in five million years, the two galaxies will collide. Wait, I, I have to quickly show you. The Andromeda Galaxy. So. Oh, yeah, yeah. So while he's playing that up. Um, meanwhile, what do you think will happen to the stars in the Milky Way and the Andromeda Galaxy? What do you think will happen to our solar system in that collision? Do you think the solar system will make it through, assuming the solar system still exists then? Do you think it won't make it through? Discuss amongst yourselves. <laughs> I want, I want you to keep one thing in mind here. What's the size of stars? What's the size of solar systems? So I'm going to write that down on the board for you. Um, Any ideas? What do you think will happen? Any guesses? So, hands up if you think the solar system will, will make it through the collision. Hands up if you think the solar system will be destroyed or otherwise disrupted. Okay. So what's um, someone someone on the side of uh, disrupted? What's your what's your logic? Yep. Well, everything has gravity, so <coughs> if a bunch of new um, stars and exoplanets are traveling through mm -hmm. our solar system, maybe yeah. their gravity might affect ours. Yeah, and so you throw everything. You off. learned about the three-body problem, right? Um, Nicholas mentioned earlier in his classical dynamics lecture that if you have three bodies, they're chaotic, right? So if you have, like, let's say you just have the sun and the earth. It's fairly simple, but if you introduce a third body, and the effect of that third body is actually appreciable, if the gravitational effect is appreciable, you, you'll end up with chaos, right? Um, but as it turns out, the, the people who said that it won't be significantly disrupted are more correct. Because on the scale of the size of the solar system, this, oh, I should have written down, the solar system is, uh, Solar system's diameter is eight, um, um, 11, sorry, 11 um, light hours. So we're talking about the difference between 11 light hours 
and, and let's say all of the other solar systems are on the same size, right? All of the other star systems are on the same size. 11 8 light hours on the scale of like separated by four light years. So galaxies are in effect mostly empty space. So when you have like the Andromeda galaxy and the Milky Way colliding, the word colliding isn't really a good word to use there. The better term is merging. And it's unlikely that two stars will ever interact, collide, or like merge, or anything like that. The stars will re remain like spaced apart as ever, more or less. What will happen is the black holes at the center will find their way to the center of the building. Of the, yeah. Of the, yeah. Wait, yeah. so will mm -hmm. they just like go through each other and then continue their own journey? They won't continue because they, there is enough of a gravitational effect that once they merge together, they'll form this like bigger galaxy that's just like a bigger blob, right? And so the stars will slow down and like they'll form a like a bigger galaxy together, but this will happen on such long time scales that you won't notice and that it, for all practical purposes you'll never like nothing will actually ever collide with anything else. Alright? So um, and I'm gonna zoom out still further now. So we, we, we talked about the nearest galaxy to ours. Um, both the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy belong to the Virgo supercluster of galaxies. There are some some um, uh, hundred galaxies in the Virgo supercluster on order. Before 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 we go there, um, just a quick aside. So Sharon and I like to take pictures of stuff in space, and this is a picture of uh, one particular galaxy called M51, which is the Whirlpool galaxy, which we took, and like oh. this gives you a sense of of how galaxies look in space in general. This is similar to how our Milky Way looks. In fact, this galaxy is in the process of colliding with another galaxy. And so you can see that it's actually like sort of eating up this other galaxy. Keep in mind that there are billions of stars in this galaxy, and very few of them are actually colliding or otherwise being disrupted. Mm -hmm. It's mostly gas, and it's gravitational effects on large scales, but individual stars are not colliding. Right, so, so we have the Virgo supercluster, around 100 galaxies like our, like our Milky Way. The Milky Way and, and the Andromeda galaxies are really the giants of our Virgo supercluster. Um, these are the largest galaxies. Now, if we zoom out still further, you get, on order, 10 million such galaxy superclusters in the universe. And on the largest scales, um, importantly, um, we see that the galaxies arrange themselves in these filamentous structures across the universe. Something like this, yeah. Um, and this is really cool. But it's important to mention, on the largest scales of the universe, the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. So the universe is So um, what does that actually mean? So homogenous means like. Have um, you ever been to the grocery store? You've seen like gallons of milk. What is what does the milk say? It says like homogenized milk. Right? Yeah. So we don't expect the universe on the largest scales. The universe doesn't look like boba. Like it doesn't have like chunky stuff in it. Like on the largest scales, it's like milk. Um, it's even throughout. And isotropic means in every direction, um, it's around the same amount of stuff. Right? We don't expect if you go in one direction. You don't expect like the universe to be like there's way more stuff in one direction than another direction. Uh, the, the, that's a way of saying basically the matter is fairly evenly distributed through, throughout the universe. Um, and we've made measurements of these things, and we know this to be true. So, um, so now we're going to transition from talking about the scales of the universe and the sizes in the universe to some properties that we observe of the universe, um, specifically how stars form and how planets form. So I'm going to start by showing you uh, can you try to show off the light? Uh, more, more of uh, our pictures, because I like doing that and I like to show off. <laughs> All right, so, so this is the Andromeda, um, or the Orion Nebula, um, the Great Orion Nebula. And this is what is called a star-forming region. And so I showed you the, the previous image of a, a full galaxy, this one, right? You see these pink knots? All these pink knots in the galaxy? Each of those are nebulae. 
They're clouds of gas and dust. And this is one example that is in our own galaxy. Right? So this cloud of gas and dust has stars that are forming at its, at its center. And how does that actually happen? So you have a cloud of gas and dust, and gravitationally it starts to collapse, and it starts to coalesce, and it starts to get more and more compact. And as it gets more and more compact, it starts to spin. You remember from your classical mechanics lecture, um, when conservation of angular momentum, um, and we also, I think, mentioned in, our, in, in the lecture that as things start to spin, they tend to flatten out. Did we mention this? I don't know, but um, you like you you might have seen like the example of like the ballerina, um, or like um, a, like if if a ballerina like is like rotating, if they bring their arms in, they start to rotate faster. This is an example of conservation of angular. Momentum. Yeah. So so even if there's very little angular momentum or, or very little angular velocity in this gigantic gas cloud, as the thing starts to collapse in, it starts rotating really quickly, and so then you get what are called protoplanetary and protostellar, oops, protostellar disks. Um, let me fast forward to an image of that. Okay? So this is, this is an example of a protostellar disk. You have your protostar, which means pre-star at the center, and you have gas that's spinning or, or orbiting around it. And, these, and this is an actual image taken by the ALMA, Alma Observatory, uh, ALMA Radio Telescope. And these gaps in the rings, in, in, in the disk, we think are due to planets that are carving out these, these gaps. So this is how stars begin to form. So now I've shown you one um, star forming region. I'll just show you other ones because they're kind of pretty. So this is like the Heart Nebula. Um, it's got another star forming region, the Lot 15 at the center. Um, the Rosette Nebula, another star forming region. And this is a star cluster. So once the gas sort of disperses and forms these protostellar like disks, um, you give it a little bit more time, most of the gas continues to coalesce into stars. And oh, um, yeah, one thing real quick, what makes a star a star? What do you think about it, it is about a star that makes it like a star a star? Any ideas? Any thoughts? As opposed to yeah. a planet. It could make some fusion in the core. Exactly. So, so um, we define stars based on whether in, in like their cores, they're fusing. The, the, this is how stars are, are fundamentally powered. Um, they're so dense that in their center, mostly made of hydrogen, right? They fuse the hydrogen atoms together. And when you fuse those hydrogen atoms together to form helium, you release energy. That energy powers a star, and, and it, it, it illuminates the star. It's what makes the stars glow. Right? Um, I want you to start thinking of planets almost like, like Jupiter and Saturn, almost like failed stars. They're stars that, um, that's, a bit, that's a bit mean, but um, <laughs> like they didn't, have, they didn't gain enough mass to become, to start fusing. They don't have enough pressure at their centers to fuse hydrogen into heavier elements. And so they don't glow, but in effect they're formed the same way as like stars are. So, so now we have these disks of matter. At the center of these disks, usually, there's enough of an aggregation of matter to form a really dense object, which is dense enough and has enough matter where hydrogen atoms in the centers of, of this start to co collide and fuse and form helium. And then we get these sort of, from, from those mo molecular gas clouds that I showed you earlier, you get these clusters. They're called open clusters. Yeah. Well, can you explain a little bit more what makes the hydrogen fuse? Together? Yeah. Yeah. So if like if you have a um, star, um, stars are sort of balanced by their um, by two things, right? Stars are extremely like dense already, and so they have a um, they have a lot of gravitational pressure pulling in on every bit of the star, right? Um, and then simultaneously, there's like if you what prevents a star from just collapsing down into a black hole, right? There has to be something preventing that from happening. And what that is, is it's a combination of things, but mainly it's, um, it's the fact that as you like, squeeze everything closer and closer together, eventually you start fusing the hydrogen atoms in the cores of these stars. And that produces heat, that produces light. 
And that heat and light, in its attempt to get out, creates pressure. And that pressure is what balances against the force of gravity. So stars are always in this delicate equilibrium between the outwards pressure generated by the, the light and heat that they're creating and the, and the gravitational pressure trying to collapse them down. Right. So, all right. so I've shown you this, this picture. There are more pictures that Alma has taken of disks. These are, these are really cool. Alma is like a, it's a large array of radio telescopes. So it's pretty cool in itself. Yeah. So now, can you turn on the lights again? So now I'm going to explain more about stars and how, and how they work. So let's hit the first, first part. Yeah. Okay. So we start off with a gas cloud. And this gas cloud forms these disks, multiple of these disks, which form into stars, right? You can either get a low mass star, like our sun, reasonably sized. And so first I'll start by, by describing what happens with those, with those stars. Um, so you get this star, it starts fusing hydrogen. And once it starts fusing hydrogen, Shishir mentioned that there's this delicate balance between the, the light and, and heat that's, that's causing the, the outwards pressure and the gravity that's causing an inwards pressure. And they're in, in equilibrium. So astronomers like to put stars on these diagrams. This is, a, um, you might remember from the, the, the lecture last week, right? We talked about black bodies, right? Um, one of the things we discussed is that things that are hotter, first of all, one crucial point, everything glows to some degree, right? But things that are hotter ha are like, um, are bluer, and things that are cooler are redder. And it can extend even outside the visible spectrum. Like things that are super, super hot will go in ultraviolet. Things that are super, super cold will glow in like radio waves. But um, uh, importantly, things that are hotter are bluer and things that are colder are redder. And this applies to stars as well. The coolest stars, um, you can actually, just by looking at the star's color, you can tell what its temperature is. If you go out in the night sky, you'll see stars that are red and stars that are blue. And you can immediately tell the blue stars are hot and the, and the red stars are cool. So this is what we observe. Think of temperature as a sort of proxy for color. Think of luminosity, which is L, as, as, as a proxy for brightness. Okay? This is what we observe. If we just observe a bunch of stars and we plot them on this, on this plot where temperature goes this way, but in effect, this is red and this is blue. There with us, this is very confusing, but there's um, there's reasons for why we, we plot it this way, but make sure you keep in mind which side is which, right? Temperature is going the wrong way in this graph. So you're having like red on, on your right side and, and blue on your left side. This is what we observe. Okay, so this is what I'm going to draw for now. What, what's going on here? This is, this is a mess, okay? So these are the stars we observe in the night sky, and, these, and we're plotting their color over their brightness, remember? So what this actually means is cooler stars tend to be less luminous, okay? That's, that's good. Warmer stars tend to be more luminous, and hot stars tend to be really luminous. Past a certain point, we see this break away. This is a turn-off point in the HR diagram. This, this, this is called Hertzsprung. Oh, the whole graph itself is called a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. 
And it's important because it allows us, at a glance, to look at the most important properties of stars. So the first thing I'm going to tell you is that this track is what we call the main sequence. Okay? And what that means is there's a certain point in a star's lifetime, right after it starts becoming dense enough to start fusing hydrogen, all the way until the point where it runs out of all hydrogen that to, to fuse, that a star is on the main sequence. So what we observe is that as long as a star is burning hydrogen, it will continue to be on this main sequence. And what, what we see is that cooler stars tend to be less luminous, and bluer stars tend to be more luminous on this main sequence. Okay, wait, um, I'm, I'm going to interject real quick and ask you to discuss why you think, why is it that cooler stars um, are, uh, are less bright on the main sequence, right? And, and I'll give you a hint, an important hint, is that um, keep in mind that I told you about this delicate equilibrium between the gravitational pressure and, or the, the gravitational force pulling the stars in and the, the light pressure pushing them out. So discuss amongst yourselves and like, try to figure out why, why this is the case. <laughs> Like, what do you think smaller stars will look like? Alright, any ideas? What do you guys expect? Yeah? Well, if there's equilibrium in cells, then it must be growing as it's growing lighter or brighter. Mm -hmm. that's a, th yeah, that's a good guess. So, what, one thing we sort of assume is that stars don't give off much mass throughout their lifetimes. Um, they don't change much in mass. Why is this? It's because light itself is very, is very light. Um, so, if a star is just giving off light and neutrinos, it really doesn't lose much mass. So, from the start of a star's lifespan to the end of its lifespan, it's going to have the same mass. That mass is a constant. What, what changes over a star's lifespan? Well, we have age. The age can change. What else can change? Any ideas? What it's made of? Like what it's made of, yes, energy. yes, that can change, yeah. Because it fuses so hydrogen into helium and helium uh -huh. into like heavy. But so so remember, as long as the star is on this main sequence track, it's fusing hydrogen. So maybe the composition will change a little bit, but not that much. Okay. What else can change about a star? Density. Density can change, yes. So if the star's mass is the same and density is changing then what's changing about the star? Um, the radius. Yeah, the volume. Right? The volume, volume right? Um, and what else? What, what, what have I plotted on this and this axis that can change? Yeah? Uh, color? Yeah, the color or the, or the temperature of the star can change. And lastly? Brightness. Yes, brightness. So, so these are things about a star that can change throughout its lifespan. And so one can think of all of these different properties of a star, brightness, temperature, color, radius, as functions of time or age. So if we actually plot out, and, and, and um, this, this, is, this is a different kind of graph. It's called an isochrome but it has the same axes. Um, so
So how is this graph different from this graph? Well, in this particular graph, we're only going to look at one type of star, or one. We're going to control for a certain variable in this case, and that is age. And if we do that, we see that stars form this neat trap, okay, where they start off at a certain temperature, and we see stars that go to higher and higher temperatures, higher and higher brightnesses. So this is the same thing as this, right? Is it? It's not actually. So. Is what we have looks. So he's, uh, the different lines are start are like, if you look at different ages, this is how the tracks are going to work. Yeah, so I'm going to say this is like t is equal to 100 million years. This is equal to t is equal to 200 million years. t is equal to 300 million years. These are completely arbitrary. But it gives you an idea. If we control for the age of a star, what is the only thing about the star that can, that can change that would cause a difference in these, in this line? That would be the mass of the star. So starting from the lowest mass of a star and going up the mass chain, we see this difference in temperature and brightness. So the crucial thing about this is that uh, the takeaway message is cooler stars are less massive. Um, hotter stars are more massive. Cooler stars are also dimmer, and hotter stars are brighter, right? And if you go back to the question of equilibrium, this makes sense, because if a star is more massive, there's more gravitational pressure, right? If there's more gravitational pressure, it gets like crushed down more. And if it's getting crushed down more, then it's, there's going to be more fusion going. More fusion means more light. So you can see how a more massive star is going to be hotter, because there's more light, right? more heat. Um, it's going to be, um, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, bluer and brighter because there's more heat and light, right? And it's 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 going to be higher on this diagram as well. And yeah, and the and the opposite is true cooler stars. And lastly, one more thing I want to mention is look at this turnoff point, the point at which. So we know that as long as a star stays on this roughly linear track, it's fusing hydrogen. This turnoff point is where stars stop fusing hydrogen and start fusing helium. Now, other elements. And, and this is important because, um, again, when we're talking about the equilibrium, we're talking about um, like a delicate balance between the gravitational force and the outward pressure caused by fusion. If you suddenly start fusing something else, um, that equilibrium point is going to change. And that's what you're observing here. You're observing the term. Exactly. At the turn off, you're observing like a different equilibrium point. And one thing to notice is that the turn off point is different for different ages. And essentially what this means is that high mass stars die, shine bright and die young. Low mass stars last for a really long time. When a star is born, it has a certain mass. That mass is its fuel. It can use that fuel for a certain amount of time. The most important thing about stars and what we understand about stars, in my opinion, is that low mass stars conserve their fuel. They're fuel efficient. They last for a really long time. In some cases, hundreds of billions of years. The higher mass stars shine brightly, and even though they have more fuel than low mass stars, they use up that fuel a lot more quickly. And so in effect, they end up dying much more quickly. So if we plot this diagram over a range of different ages, we see that the, the, the turnoff point, the point at which they, 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 they stop fusing hydrogen and start fu um, uh, fusing other elements, is, is shorter and shorter as you, grow, as you go to the low, um, high mass. So, so the main sequence sort of represents like the, the, the bulk of a star's lifespan. Right? Most, it spends most of its time on the main sequence. We're now going to talk about the end stages of a star's life. But before that, I want to say these stars over here, these cool red stars, they are so long lived that if, if a star like that was formed um, when the universe itself was born, 
it wouldn't have died yet. So these stars just don't die. We, we haven't observed them to die, and they aren't going to die for a really long time. So for these stars, um, right now, like talking about the end of their life is irrelevant because there are almost no stars like these in the universe that have actually died. And one more thing I want to mention, which is, how many of these stars do you think are dead? Okay, so our sun, this, this, is, this is a good thing to, to talk about. Our sun is a pretty average star. Um, I'm not going to mention star okay. yeah. but our star is what's called a G-type star. So it's an average, middling um, uh, brightness star as far as stars on the main sequence go. How many stars do you think are more massive than the sun? And how many stars do you think are less massive than the sun? You can discuss that amongst yourself. Is our, su is our sun common or one of many? And if there are cooler stars than our sun, are those more common than the sun or less common than the sun? Like, this is a very important question in astronomy. Yes. Thoughts? Any thoughts? Yep. Yeah, good. Oh, so maybe because the different stars will last longer, there's more of them at the time. Uh huh. That's yeah. That's absolutely correct. Uh, what was your? Oh, same thing. Same thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Dimmer stars are way more common. So our sun is like. But this is not just because they last for a really long time. It's not only because of that. Although it is partly to do with that. There are way more cooler stars, they're called M-type stars, um, than M and K-type stars, than stars that are hotter than our sun. And in fact, if you go, if you just look up at the night sky, and you see all of the stars you can see, none of them are M-type cool stars. Why is that? You can't see these stars, and yet they're so common. Exactly. So, so, so the stars that you end up observing are the ones that are brightest, even though bright stars are really rare. Um, so that's like an example of an observational bias. Um, a lot of the stars you'll see in the night sky are actually way hotter than our sun, and it's just it's just because they're bright that we that we observe them in the night sky. <coughs> M type stars are actually or like cool stars are actually way more common. So now we're going to discuss. Um, we've talked about the the lifespan of a star. So what happens? Once it's a star has spent its fuel. Yeah. Um, is there a reason that we're only seeing red and blue stars instead of like green, purple, and uh, Okay, purple. so this is what we discussed in the thermodynamics lecture, right? It's it's it has to do with with um, Boltzmann distributions, right? And so es um, um, uh, essentially, these are stars are black bodies. We talked about black bodies. The human body glows. Um, a coil on a stove glows. Um, everything glows. Stars glow for pretty much the same reason. You can approximate that, that they glow because of black body radiation. And basically, these, um, these distributions of, if, if you graph the distribution of, of color versus, versus how bright it is in each color, um, and you do the math out, it so happens that you will see red and you'll see like yellow, and you'll see blue, but you won't ever see green specifically. Um, and the reason, the, the sort of shoddy reason for that is because... Um, so this is like the visible spectrum, right? Red is over here, blue is on this side, right? This is how um, purple would look, right? Yeah. Red, like you, you might have heard, like you mix red and blue and you get purple, right? So red is on the, one side is on the visible spectrum, blue is on the other side. Um, uh, distributions don't actually look like this. Green is like this, right? Just in the center, right? But in, in, in practice, you, you um, objects that glow have distributions that look something more like this, right? So they have, they have some, a little red light, mostly like 
this light, and then like um, a little like blue light as well. And when you mix those all together, you end up with something that's more like yellow, yeah. or like reddish or bluish. It's right. a good question, um, but this is sort of like um, you have to go into the math to truly understand this. So I'm going to move on. For now. You can ask this after. So you have your gas cloud. It forms either a low mass star. or a high mass star. The way these two stars die is radically different. Radically different. A low mass star is like our sun. Our sun is considered a low mass star. What's the, what's the demarcation? You can think about, it's about 11 times the mass of our sun. The mass of our sun. Okay? So how do low mass stars die? They stop fusing hydrogen at some point in their life. Some of them start fusing helium. Some of them start um, fusing, fusing helium. And when they do that, they, they sort of form these. Can I get a red marker? Okay. They form red giants. And when the sun reaches the end of its life, it's going to form a red giant, it's going to expand out, and it's going to envelop the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and it's going to go all the way, I think, out to Mars, when it, when it eventually becomes a red giant. So remember, this is, this is the idea that um, at, like, once they stop fusing hydrogen, once they start fusing heavier elements, they reach a different equilibrium state. This equilibrium state, like, Helium is not as efficient at producing energy as hydrogen is, right? So there's a lot less pressure, and so that equilibrium point is different, yeah. right? So, and that's a red giant. And finally, what will happen is that it sort of expels out its outer layers, and what's left at the center is a little remnant called the white dwarf. That's like the dead core of the star. That was and we explained in the thermodynamics lecture that these white dwarfs are held up by electron degeneracy pressure. So the, the Fermi levels and all of that we explained, um, that is what's holding up this white dwarf. Eventually, it will radiate out all of the remaining energy and, um, and will we'll cease to, to exist. That's called a black dwarf. Yeah. Um, it, but this happens over time scales that are so long that the universe, 14 billion year old universe, hasn't actually had enough time for this to ever happen. So, right. so and the other, the other option is we have a star greater than 11 times the mass of the sun, or thereabouts. We consider this a high mass star. When it stops fusing hydrogen, it starts fusing helium. It forms a bigger star which is called a red supergiant. It doesn't stop at helium, it keeps going. Once all of the star is helium, it will start fusing helium to form carbon. Well, diff different elements, but at some point you'll get a carbon star, a star that's made of mostly carbon atoms. And even past that, you'll get iron. And once the star starts fusing elements into iron, iron is a special, special atom in astronomy. Um, it's an atom that requires energy to fuse. All, 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 all of the elements require energy to fuse, but they produce more energy than it takes to yeah. fuse. Yeah. But for iron, it takes more energy to fuse iron than it actually produces. So suddenly, this stops being a fuel source. So within one second, of the star having run out of, of, of fuel and starting to fuse iron, within one second, the star goes from a red supergiant to no fuel left. And it's fusing iron, and it has no light left to hold up the star. This happens in a second. And the star has maybe lasted for a few million years up till now. So and now it collapses. So, so now there's no pressure holding it outwards, and it's just gravity pulling it inwards. And so the gravity takes over, it just collapses down. And it keeps collapsing down. It keeps on collapsing until it reaches the point of electron degeneracy pressure. 
that we mentioned earlier in the class. And it keeps going even further than that until the strong nuclear force, which hopefully we'll mention later, is what is holding, is, is, is repulsive. And that's what's holding the star up. It's, 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 it's neutron, or it's, um, wow. neutron 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 neutron. No, no, no. I think it's, it's, it's a strong nuclear force is repulsive. Oh, it's, that's it's, it's neutron neutron. Neutron because yeah. it's all broken. This is, this is a supernova stage. So I'm, I'm pretty sure about this. Um, so this, this, I, I, this, basically what happens is the star keeps collapsing until it's so, so small that the strong nuclear force is holding it up, and then it rebounds. And then this is what we call the supernova. Um, and the supernova is an immensely, immensely luminous, bright, cataclysmic event which, which can briefly outshine an entire galaxy. Um, and so for, for an idea of scale, supernova actually, they, they, don't, they, they aren't just like, um, they are sort of explosions, but um, you might think that they just like flash in and out of existence. They actually last for like months. And for like months, one single supernova outshines the entire galaxy of like billions and billions of stars, right? So this is like a massive, a massive. event of like massive proportions. And there are two routes that the supernova can go. One route is um, you end up getting a remnant which is held up by neutron degeneracy pressure. Um, and this is called, as you know, a neutron star. And the other option, if the star is so massive that even neutron degeneracy pressure cannot hold the star up. This is when you get a black hole. So starting from the lowest mass of star, all the way to higher mass stars, all the way to the highest masses of stars, this is how they die. And of course, the higher mass you get, the rarer they are. So, like, um, these are, which are these these remnants, which are called like white dwarfs, which is the remnant, and the planetary nebula, which is like what surrounds it. These are very common. Most stars die like this. These are very rare. And these are still rare. Yeah. So you said um, the uh, supernova can outshine the whole galaxy sometimes. Mm -hmm. So where does that energy come from? So that energy is like effectively you're combining like all of the heavy elements in the universe effectively are produced in supernova. Right. One way you can think about this is if you remember back to our um, special relativity lecture e equals m c squared. Matter has a lot of energy. And when you convert matter into energy, stars are good, reasonably good at doing this. Um, they convert a tiny bit of their mass, so tiny that you would never notice any mass loss in the star, but they convert a tiny bit of their mass into neutrinos and light throughout their lifespan over a really slow, gradual process. You can think of a supernova as doing this really fast. It's still not a significant amount of mass that's converted to energy, but it's done so quickly and so rapidly that in that time, um, a humongous amount of light exists. Yeah? Wait, so you said the neutron star and black hole are more rare than the first one. Mm -hmm. But like, didn't you say that <clears throat> the smaller stars last longer though? So shouldn't there be mm -hmm. more of the, the death result of bigger stars? Well, so well, the other thing I said at that point was that smaller stars are also just more common. Oh, okay. um, and so, so yes, neutron stars and black holes and supernova in general are, are really rare. Um, but when we see them, we see them from a long distance away in other galaxies. We, also, see, we see these. These are called planetary nebulae. Also, stars are constantly forming. So even if like, the high mass stars are dying off quickly, you're also constantly forming new high mass stars and low mass stars, right? And so those those also exist. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is how stars die. Yeah. Um, let's see. So the last thing we're uh, or um, 
depending on time. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is, um, so if you look up into the night sky, you see like a ton of stars, right? How do you know what you're actually looking at? How do you make any measurements? So astronomy is sort of like, there's a, there's a unique challenge in astronomy. The only thing we get from the sky is light. That's like literally the only thing we get from the sky until very recently, but we'll, we'll mention this later. Um, so how do, you, how do we understand like all of this that we've explained so far, all of the scales we've talked about? How do we know all of this? It you just go outside you, and, and, and like you look up at the night sky and it's just a <coughs> bunch of stuff that looks like, like, for all we know, there could be a firmament and like, like it's just like plastered up there. How do yeah, we know like, that this stuff is at different distances? How do we know that galaxies exist? How does that, all of that information come from? So we need to leverage the properties of light in order to, in order to understand everything that we know about the universe. So I think this is one of the coolest parts about astronomy, that astronomers are so clever that they've taken something, which is the night sky, and we've sort of, over time, worked out how to cleverly use the different properties of light that's coming from the night sky um, to learn about everything in space. So, so when we're talking about light from something in the sky, what are its properties? So, um, like, if you can discuss this and like list down what like um, the properties and every property you think it's possible to measure about light. Light. Yeah. yeah. color, frequency, those are all aliases of the same idea yeah. for light. Yeah. Any other ones? Mm -hmm. velocity? Oh, yeah. The shift they talk about. Uh, the shift? Doppler shift. Ah. Doppler shift. So that's an example. We're, we're going to group that with wavelength, although you're absolutely correct. That's technically a change in the wavelength of the light. So remember, we're not, we're not measuring the, how are we measuring the Doppler shift? In order to measure the Doppler shift, we have to look at the color of the star really, really precisely, mm -hmm. right? And the color will change over. But that's not a property of the light itself. We're trying to look for things about the light that we're receiving. Things about the light itself. Okay, so we have brightness. Anything else? There are definitely other properties that we've mentioned in the class before. Here's, here's, um, here's the basic one. If you look at, like, um, the, the obvious one that, that you might not have thought of is is a location, right? Um, depending on where the light is coming from, that can tell us a whole lot about the star that's over there. Might not is not the same as the star that's up there. Yeah. So, so location, okay. location. Anything else? There's like a couple more. Like I think uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna say this. position. Position. Um, the velocity. Well, oh, light, the light all travels at sea, so. This isn't really a property we can leverage, although you're technically correct. Yeah? Uh, I don't know if this is one thing of polarization. Yeah, yeah. Um, that is like, yeah, that's like the last one. All right. There's so one polarization other is, is often forgotten, but, but I'm just going to quickly interject and say polarization is like, you have light, it's a wave. It can look like this as a wave, or it can look like this as a wave, right? And the polarization is the direction of the light, like roughly speaking, yeah. the, 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 the direction of the wave. And this is, this is an important quantity as well. It's a property that's intrinsic to light. So how do we make measurements from each of these properties? 
So we're going to go into like what exactly we do to, to make these variables. Right. So each of these properties of like now we have like somewhat of an exhaustive list um, of everything we can possibly measure about the light we see from the night sky. Each of these has a name. Measurement of the position of things is called astrometry. Technically also just like imaging, right? If you take an image of the sky, you're getting information of how, like where the light is. Um, so, so astrometry slash, you can put, well, like image, imaging, right? Yeah, technically the, the position. If you're measuring the position, then that's called astrometry, okay? Um, measuring the brightness of objects, that's called photometry. You can kind of see a pattern. Measuring the wavelength, spectroscopy, okay, spectrometry, let's <laughs> keep the pattern. <laughs> and measurement of the polarization, astronomers are not very creative. Um, so right. these are like the cardinal measurement techniques that astronomers use to pretty much know everything we know. Using these, with the exception of gravitational waves, which, has, which is a very, very recent development. And neutrinos. And neutrinos. And neutrinos yeah. This is everything we know about the sky and space and the universe. So I'm going to go into each one now and, and try to briefly explain some things we can do with each of these. Uh, and then Shashir is going to explain possibly one of the most important after that. So let's start with astrometry. All right. So astrometry is measuring the positions of objects in the night sky. Usually, what we do is we take pictures of objects. And then we look at those pictures really closely to see how objects move in those images. So based on looking at the positions, we get two axes of, we get sort of an x and a y axis of movement of objects in the night sky. What can we do with that? Well, let's say we see, we see something in the sky and it's moving in the sky. It just looks like a speck to us. We, we can't resolve it. We just see a speck that's moving. We do astrometry and we record the position of this object very carefully. And we do the math of Kepler's laws and gravitation. And based on that, we can learn that this is an asteroid. Or like, um, if you've ever been on like a car, like on a highway or something, you, you probably notice like things that are close to you like the fence railing right next to the highway, it's whizzing past you. The mountains in the distance, they're not moving as much, right? So it's the same with, with stuff in the sky. If, if you're seeing something that's moving really fast across the sky, you know it's probably closer to you. If you're seeing something that's barely moving, it's probably farther away. And based on the curvature of the motion, we can actually plot out where this object and what this object's trajectory is in our solar system. Yeah, so, so the word planet comes from the Greek for wanderer because very early astronomers noticed that when they look up in the night sky, some of the stars move a lot in the night sky over time. Right? Stars. And those are actually planets, and they're, they're, they're much closer to us. They're way closer to us. Remember, so going back to scales, they're within the solar system diameter. Right? So again, astrometry was like the first technique that was used to find out, and this is not trivial if you think about it, that planets are not the same as stars. This is a big deal. And it's, and it's not like... It's not trivial to do this. They look the same when you look up at the night sky. And if you don't have a telescope, it's very difficult to figure this out. But people did this. And so you can also use that if you see like a really dim speck moving pretty fast across the night sky. It's probably an asteroid, because asteroids are in our solar system, and therefore we expect them to move faster. So even stars, if you use really, really precise astrometry, sometimes you can make out the motion of stars themselves. Yeah. Um, and so this is useful, for example, if you want to um, if you notice that a lot of stars are moving together in the night sky, you can infer they probably all originated from the same place. And so, remember, going back to the part about like, 
on there yet, but like you saw those pictures of those open clusters, right? They all form together, they start moving in the same direction together, right? And over time, they, they disperse, but they still are sort of moving in the same direction. And so if you find, if you notice that stars in the sky are all moving in the same direction, chances are it's because they form together. And that's a really important thing that you can say. And the last thing you can do with astrometry, um, not the last, there are tons of things, but one of the things we're going to talk about. So we talked about like, this is like a 1600s ancient astronomy measurement to figure out that planets are different from stars. Well, today, very recently, and in fact, our own um, faculty advisor for this decal, Professor Jessica Liu, works on this research. Um, and this is looking at the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. How do we know it exists? We, we don't really, except until very recently when we took a picture. Um, the only reason we knew it existed prior to this, and the only reason we know its mass and other properties, is because we very, very carefully observe stars that are like whizzing around nothing. And they're going really fast, but around nothing. Um, and this is like quizzical, but naturally now we know that, that there's a black hole at the center and these stars are going around the black hole. And if we do the math, we can calculate the mass of the black hole based on how fast the stars are going, how far away they're orbiting, etc. Um, and so this is another way that astrometry is used. Um, super massive black hole. Black. So to be clear, we're not actually measuring the black hole's position itself. We're only measuring stars that are orbiting around the black hole. Right, so, so, okay, this is astrometry. So the next important one is photometry, brightness. What can brightness tell you about things? We've already shown you one example, right? The Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. On the y-axis, we see the luminosity, right? That's a proxy for the brightness of the stars that we observe. So brightness can tell you a little something about what the, the mass of the star is. We know that already. Okay. There's other very important information that brightness can tell you. Um, I think this one is a particularly cool one because I'm like as like if you're if you, if you do astronomy, you don't notice things changing over your lifespan, um, especially not things outside the solar system. Brightness is one exception to the rule. If you're if um, you can, there are stars that literally change in brightness in the night sky. Like these are called variable stars or variable sources, right? Um, these stars like change in brightness over time scales that you can observe. There are stars that you can go out and see, like one day it'll be, it'll be brighter and then you go out like 13 days later and it'll be, it'll be noticeably dimmer. Um, so what's, what are things we can actually do with photometry? Again, measuring the brightness of stars. One thing is we can learn about variable stars. We look at stars that change in brightness. We see different patterns of how they change in brightness. So we create what's called a light curve, which is a graph of brightness. This is extremely, extremely important, especially for the discussion tomorrow. And also, it's a what central, it? central part of our, of, of our, our meet my and Shashir's research. So um, I would encourage you to keep this in mind. This is called a light curve. Sorry. All right. So what we can see is that certain stars change in brightness like, like this. Other stars change in brightness like this. Okay. And there are hundreds of different ways. There are so many different ways that stars can change in brightness. But I'm just going to give you two examples. One are pulsating stars. And these are what are called eclipsing binaries. So you can get some idea of how a star might look like, what its behavior is based on its brightness. So we just see one speck, and we see the speck is changing in brightness. And based on that, we can tell if the star is a pulsating star, or whether it's two stars that are orbiting around each other and blocking their light as they orbit oh, around And the each third other. category that's important with brightness is cataclysmic variables, right? Um, this goes from all the way to like, objects that are sort of like like accreting mass or like they're they're uh, you have like a little white dwarf and you're you're gaining mass from something and like it suddenly ends up way way brighter right than than than, um, than it was before and like an extreme example of that is actually just a straight up supernova 
um, uh, supernovae, you don't notice anything before. It's like way too dim. And suddenly, you notice an, uh, something that's shining so brightly, it's like brighter than the whole galaxy. So again, we can construct a light curve for a supernova. And what we see is that usually we catch it at, at somewhere near its peak. And sometimes we see it fade away to obscurity over a long period of time. And this is how the light curve looks. <coughs> and in another case, we see it sort of plateau out before fading <laughs> to obscurity. And this is also very very, very significant. Basically, there are two classes of supernova. Type one, yeah, one, A. I'm just going to say type one. And type two. Yeah. But we'll get to that a bit more um, in a bit. Um, I want to quickly move on to the next important um, uh, measurement. Yeah, OK, so the next important measurement is spectroscopy. and, and um, uh, you already mentioned an important part about spectroscopy is Doppler shifts. Doppler shifts can allow us to measure velocities. So we've talked about measuring velocities in x and y, right? Doppler shifts allow us to measure velocities in z, right? In the axis so towards and away from us. How does spectroscopy actually work? I'm going to write down spectroscopy. spectroscopy. Okay, what do we do? We we don't just look at the color, like we don't just like, oh, that star looks red, it looks blue. No, we, we, don't, we don't do that. Um, what we do is we break the light up, just like you can take a prism and break the light of the sun or something into, into a rainbow. We do the same thing, except with telescopes, uh, we break the light of a star into a spectrum, um, starting from red, going to blue. Or, or, or you, can, you can do this outside of visible, visible wavelengths as well. Um, and what we see in these, for, for reasons we are running out of time, but yeah, but I will we'll explain, explain this in the quantum mechanics lecture better. Yeah. We'll we see these absorption lines in these or emission lines. And so like they're, they're like bright lines or like dark lines in the spectrum that sort of act like a barcode. Um, the do how you actually observe the Doppler shift is that these barcode lines will actually shift back and forth. And so that's how you, like, that's how you can tell um, whether an object is moving towards or away from it. It'll be Doppler shifted, and these barcode lines will sort of shift. But not only that, these absorption lines are essentially, they are a, a fingerprint. We can use them to learn about the chemical composition of different things in the universe. So in my opinion, I think spectroscopy is one of the most powerful measurement tools um, that in, in the astronomer's toolkit. Because we can measure compositions. How is that, like, how mind-blowing is that? Like, astronomers can look at the night sky, just see a bunch of specks, and know what things are made of just by looking at their colors. Chem chemical, and like, even, even further, like, on this point, the, the word helium, right, comes from the Greek root helios, because helium was first observed in the sun. It wasn't even first observed on the Earth, even though it exists on Earth. It was through this that helium was first observed, which is really, really cool, right? Um, and, and you can measure, like, radial velocity, it's called, the velocity towards or away from us, right? That's, that's an important other thing that you can use to... And the, last, and, and the last thing Shishar mentioned was, again, you can measure Doppler shifts. Mm -hmm. So, as a recap, like if you have your, your ambulance, that siren, and the ambulance is moving towards you, you sort of hear like, you, like the, 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 <laughs> the frequency shifts. Uh, the same thing happens with light. If an object is moving towards you, it's the, the light's wavelength is sort of squished, and you see the light as, as bluer. If the, light, if the object is moving away from you, the light's wavelength is sort of stretched out, and you see the light is redder. And based on this, we can use this to, to measure velocities of objects in space. And so this is a really, really big deal, velocities. So I just showed you that with these basic methods, I'm going to leave out polarimetry for now. We can measure types of objects. We can measure compositions. We can measure velocities. We can measure so many different things about 
stars. So this will become more important yeah. in the discussion. We'll, we'll take one case study in the discussion of how we know about exoplanets. But for now, I'm going to take another case study. Um, in my opinion, one of the most important things, arguably, um, that we know about the universe. In the beginning, I, I started by talking about like length scales, right? Distances. How do we know the distance to anything in the universe? How do we well, know everything's not just on a dome at yeah. the top of our sky? Like, yeah. How do we know that things are actually different distances? So, so um, as it turns out, we leverage every property of light in order to know distances at different scales. So we start out with, um, with, with um, astronomy, right? I, I told you, we know that planets are nearby because they're moving so quickly, right? Well, as it turns out, if you go slightly farther away from that, like, let's take the nearest star to our Earth. How do we know that it's four light years away? Um, well, as it turns out, this is the sun, right? Let's take the sun. And the Earth is orbiting around the sun, right? Um, and you have your, your, your closest star to, the, to this, Alpha Centauri. So right? everyone take your finger and put it in front of your eye and sort of open one eye and then close that eye and open the other eye. And look at your finger against the backdrop of the whiteboard. What do you, what do you notice? So you, it looks like your finger is moving, right? Against the backdrop of the whiteboard. This is called the parallax method. Yeah, so, so when, when the Earth is on this side, um, you see Alpha Centauri like that way, right? And when the Earth is on this side of its orbit, you see Alpha Centauri, like you'll sort of see Alpha Centauri shift relative to the background stars. Um, uh, and so like, it's the same as like, if, you, if you like close one eye and open the other eye, your, your finger shifts relative to background objects. And this is, a very, like, this is the, the, a very, very accurate way of measuring distances of things that are relatively close to us. Again, like, like the sort of equivalent of opening and closing your eyes is waiting for the Earth six months to shift Around 180 orbit, degrees right? in its orbit. So, but you'll notice even with this method that as you as you take something like if your finger were way way farther away, or if you if you try this method on something way farther away, you'll start to struggle, right? You'll you'll struggle to measure like the effect. Yeah. yeah. But how do you know your distance um, to like the background stars? So? Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Well, it turns out there are objects that are so distant, like galaxies, that you won't observe or any quasars. shift at all. Yeah, like quasars, quasars right? So you can just like look at those objects that don't move at all, and you know that those are like arbitrarily far away, right? And so you can they don't move at all, and you'll notice that yeah, you can calibrate the distance out, and you'll notice that some objects are, are shifting significantly as the Earth moves in its orbit right? against a backdrop of objects that are sort of not moving. Yeah, yeah. And so it turns out you can compute the distance to any object based on how much they move in the night sky along the six-month like period, right? Between one. Um, one observation in the next. Yeah. Wait. So how does this work? Is there some angle? Yeah. 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 So like, in, in like, how it manifests in the sky is you'll see like, if you if you zoom in really really precisely, you'll see some stars over like, over the year they'll move slightly the back and forth. They'll wobble, right? And you'll notice that. And there's a spacecraft called Gaia which has done this for a lot of stars in our galaxy. Observe really, really like, closely billions a billion stars in our galaxy and seen how much each star wobbles, and it's compiled a catalog of, of a billion stars and how distant they are based on that wobble. Okay, so, so this is like the closest scales. This is how we measure distance for the closest scales. Parallax. Now I'm going to go on to the next measurement for distance. Shashank me mentioned light curves, right? Well, as it turns out, there's a special kind of star called a Cepheid variable, right? Um, and a Cepheid variable is, um, is a kind of variable that pulsates. And um, as it turns out, people have found out very cleverly that um, uh, like there was a woman named Henrietta Leavitt who, who basically figured out that um, the period of this pulsation is related to how much light these stars put out. So there's a fundamental, the pr fundamental problem in astronomy is you can sort of analogize it to if I'm on a road and there's like a bike headlamp really close to me, and there's like a car headlamp really far away, how do I tell whether it's like a bike headlamp really close or a car headlamp really far, right? They'll look the same, right? Um, well, if you know that the car headlamp is like 100 watts, I know how much light the car headlamp is actually putting out. Now I can say, 
Um, well, if, if it's 100 watts, that's super bright. So if, if it looks dim to me, that must mean it's really far away, right? Does that make sense? Um, so, yeah. So, yeah. But for stars, how would you know how much light is coming to that star? Exactly. Know the star. It's, it's yeah. very difficult to do this, right? It's very difficult to tell that a star is like 100 watts. Like, no star is 100 watts. But. So this is actually one way of doing it. So what she found is that, um, that these special class of stars called Cepheid variables, the period at which they pulsate is related to how much light they're actually putting out. And so and this is called the period luminosity it's relation. It's really cool. It's not at all an obvious thing, mm -hmm. but the, just by seeing how long it takes for these stars to pulsate, we know how bright they are intrinsically. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. So this is, this is, this is really cool because um, Hubble, Edwin Hubble, um, a guy in the early uh, 20th century, um, did this for a star, for a Cepheid variable in the Andromeda galaxy, which is very far away, right? And uh, at the time, they thought all, there was just one galaxy. Everything was in our galaxy. They thought the Andromeda galaxy was, was part of our galaxy. And in fact, they called it the Andromeda Nebula. They thought it was a gas cloud mm -hmm. in our own galaxy. And our galaxy was the whole universe. Yeah, and so, um, uh, but Edwin Hubble measured, measured a Cepheid variable in the, the then called Andromeda Nebula, and he calculated the distance using this. He calculated the distance very close to 2.5 million light years away. And, and he figured out, okay, it's so distant that there's no way that it can be part of our galaxy. This is a whole other galaxy. And so suddenly, our sense of scale of the universe overnight just like expanded um, um, uh, like massively. So now, now they're like, like galaxies and galaxies, right? So this is um, the next rung on our distance ladder is the, the PL relation. Um, so now we have the period, so, so um, and, and the important thing is this, in order to figure out um, how this calibrates to distance, you need to use Cepheid variables, this class of stars, that are close enough that you can also measure their parallax, right? So that's how you calibrate this relation out, and then you figure out well, then what's the next part of the distance. So, so that's, this is how you climb the distance ladder, right? Um, you, so along this intersection, there will be some stars for which you can measure both of these things, and then you can calibrate the measurement, right? Then the, 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 the last one that I'm going to talk about today is redshift. Right? Um, we'll explain this more later, but the universe, as it turns out, is expanding. Right? And this means, as objects are farther and farther away, the expansion of the universe itself makes them recede from us. Right? And if objects are receding from us, this is on the large scales of the universe. These are very, very distant galaxies. Right? Um, if, if an object is receding from us, if, if you have like a galaxy, and it's receding from, from, from us, and this is the Milky Way galaxy. Um, then you look at the color, remember spectroscopy, right? Um, you, you can measure a Doppler shift. And so as it turns out, galaxies that are farther and farther away look really, really red. Um, and, uh, and this is because their light is redshifted. And uh, we measure the redshift in order to figure out how fast they're receding away from us, right? And um, based on that, we can fi figure out um, uh, how far away they are. And so this is another important rung on the, uh, on, the, on the distance ladder. There's one more important rung that I may or may not get the chance to talk about, um, but supernovae. Supernovae, that's, that's what yeah. We'll just mention it. Basically, there are a specific class of supernovae which are all exactly the same brightness, as far as we can tell, and we've calibrated the brightness of these supernovae so that we think we know how bright they are intrinsically. And so if we see one go off in another galaxy, we think we know how far that galaxy is from us. Mm -hmm. And so um, I want to, I want to, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm actually going to, I'm going to put that here, right? Supernovae. So it turns out all of these supernovae go off at the same brightness. And if they all go off at the same brightness, um, we know how bright they are. Uh, a, a caveat which no one really wants to hear, but like it's only a specific class of supernovae. Not all supernovae go off at the same brightness. And yeah, we, um, we, you can ask us this later, or we might cover this in a discussion or something. Oops. 
Yeah, so that's technically the end of class. But I want to set up um, as a last thing. I want to set up. So um, people have measured. There's actually, um, you might have seen Alex Kilpenko um, here in the class before. Um, him, along with a bunch of other people in a collaboration, um, took a bunch of supernovae, measured the universe, right? And, and figured out that it was expanding, but not only that it was expanding, but that it was accelerating in, ex in its expansion. And this is really, really weird and unexpected. And um, that sets up one of the most important things in Nicholas' lecture for next week um, in, uh, about cosmology. Um, but suffice it to say, this sets up like, a really, really interesting problem, and it makes us realize that we really don't know very much of this. We'll explain that in, in Monday's lecture. And Wednesday's discussion is going to be on exoplanets. So um, this is the topic that um, I research, so I probably think it's really cool. So, so.